Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our talk on efficient Kubernetes end-to-end -end testing, Unleash the Power of Prow. Who we are, I'm Jason Braganza. I've been an independent IT consultant for the past 20 years. Um, I also served as the announcement shadow on the 1.25 release. I currently serve as the new membership coordinator for the project. Hey everyone, my name is Priyanka Sagu. Um, I work at SUSE as a Kubernetes integration engineer. I also do a few things in the upstream Kubernetes project. Currently, I'm a technical lead for special interest group contributor experience, a GitHub admin for the Kubernetes and sub project orgs. I'm also currently the release lead for Kubernetes 129, and we are ready to release it on December 13. This is our release logo. We have some stickers for our release logo if you want. Uh, please meet us after the talk. Thank you. There are lots of stickers. Catch Priyanka after the talk. Uh, what do we have on our agenda today? We look through at the architecture of kubetest 2, see how the upstream Kubernetes project integrates with kubetest 2 and Prow. We understand how all of this fits together with a couple of in-depth demos of the upstream project uh, testing in action. So Kubernetes end-to-end -end testing. We have all our source, the Kubernetes source, uh, in GitHub repos, and folks obviously want to improve it, to add features, to find um, bugs. And so they submit their own code to the project in the form of pull requests. And uh, we need to check for brokenness. We need to check if the code's all right. So that's what we do uh, in an automated fashion. So the code's taken, uh, the PR code along with our code is taken together at a snapshot in time. Uh, we create binaries uh, based on that code. And then we stand up a cluster using the new code. Uh, this testing that happens, uh, the, the new cluster then runs a series of end-to-end -end tests. Uh, and the tests log a lot of stuff. That's what we get at the end result as artifacts. The clusters turn down. And what we have in the end is just the logs containing the test results. So all of this. Uh, process that I just showed you is basically uh, driven by kubetest2. So what is kubetest2? It's a framework for deploying Kubernetes clusters and executing end-to-end -end tests on them. It helps with cluster configuration uh, of, of various kinds. It helps with end-to-end -end testing and log collection, it, and then the disposal of the test environments. Uh, the, uh, the workflow uh, that I just described uh, basically comes like this. There is a build step, uh, there's a cluster configuration step like I just showed you, where it builds up the cluster first and then uh, brings it up. It then, uh, kubetest then runs the tests that we specify and does a lot of log collection. That's the test step. And then disposes of the test environment by bringing the cluster down. Cluster configuration, end-to-end -end testing, Test environment disposal, that's the whole flow. The architecture, uh, it's split into three independent executables, like three legs of a stool or a tripod. Uh, the main binary is kubetest 2 That's the one we use, <coughs> we use to uh, interact with uh, to drive the whole thing. But on its own, it does nothing. If you see, uh, run kubetest 2 when it's just like, says detected deployers, nothing, detected testers, nothing. So those are the missing legs of this tool. The second one is basically the deployer. Uh, kubetest2 is smart enough to notice if there's a file in the path that says kubetest2-deployer1, it recognizes it as a deployer of sorts and uh, picks it up like over here. So since we had that, it's now running kubetest2 says there's a deployer uh, over there in the highlighted portion. Similarly, we have testers uh, of various kinds. So those two uh, have the similar naming convention with kubetest2 dash test slash whatever test the name. And then once all these three legs are there, you can see kubetest2 coming and detecting the deployer and the tester. That's the architecture in sum. Here's the example. You can have multiple deployers and you can have multiple testers. 
and you can mix and match. The syntax of the command then basically becomes you, you run kubetest2 with the deployer you want, with the tests you want, and with instructions to bring the cluster up and down. So kubetest2, deployer name, uh, I've, I've split this thing into new lines for readability. So there's up, down, tester, test, followed by the tester name, and the arguments you want to pass to the tester. Like this example. Uh, it's basically the upstream CNCF Kubernetes test against a GK, GKE cluster. So kubetest2, that's the deployer name, GKE. We bring the uh, thing up and down, and we are running the Jinko tester, uh, and then telling it to run conformance tests the same. So how uh, does the upstream project uh, integrate kubetest with Prow? Take a little uh, glimpse of the workflow. So there's, we have users who, if, if lots of you are contributors, you have uh, contribute code to the Kubernetes repos, and you've seen that we can do comments and so on. And we have also something like automated commands, right? You can do a slash close, and you can do a slash test. There's a, here, for example, we're doing a test all to uh, run the code, uh, to run a test against the code. So all that is handled by a CI CD system called Prow, uh, which mimics the, uh, the uh, nature of Kubernetes as a whole, like we have a control plane that makes all the decision, decisions and the scheduling and stuff, and then uh, farms the work out to worker nodes. Similarly, with Prow, there's a service cluster which listens for events and does the scheduling and uh, distributes stuff. And there are build clusters which then the, work, uh, the tests and the work then get carried out on. So over here, this, the Prow's listening, it takes the event, sends it to the Kubernetes cluster, the Prow service cluster, and then, the, then it creates a Prow job that's scheduled on a Prow build cluster. Let's take a look at what's happening in the build cluster. Uh, the, the jobs come in, a pod's created. It, uh, for our tests, it pulls a specific image called kubekins E2E, and then that is the thing that pulls kubetest down and uh, runs it with the arguments we specify. So the primary features of kubetest, having looked at all this, is basically we get a consistent cluster lifecycle. We know how to consistently pull any kind of cluster up and down. There's decoupled implementation of deployers. You can have multiple deployers. You can have multiple testers. You can mix and match them. There's reproducible CI and local testing experience, where the stuff that you're running on your CI CD system, you can also get kubetest2 down on your system, get your um, tester down, get your deployer down, and then simulate the experience on your local machine too. Kind of the same. And it has support for Boscos, which is a Prow plugin, which uh, helps with lifecycle management, so you don't really have to deal with uh, cl bringing up another cluster itself. It will ask for a lease for an AWS service or a GKE service, and Boscos will provide it to them. We have bespoke deployers at present, Kubetest only supports GCP, GKE, and kind deployers in tree, which then how does something else work? Like I just spoke about different kinds of deployers, so how does that work? Those are external. It, uh, Kubetest enables running custom deployers for different cloud, for cloud platforms out of tree. That's how we have an AWS or Microsoft deployer working. You can write your own bespoke deployers. Uh, you can learn, there's, we don't have time for that right now, so if you want to learn a lot that my colleague Priyanka has a whole talk on it over here. So you can scan this, you can always get the slides later and check more out. So I haven't spoken, spoken about Prow and, and looking at, looked, it, looked at its architecture. Uh, let's see how it works in action. Let's, let's dive into some demos. For that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Priyanka. Thank you, Jason. So here, we, we just learned about what is kubetest2 and how it comes in the picture with Kubernetes project, um, let's see a few jobs from Kubernetes project. For example, I'm a release lead, and what matters for me is I have a green signal when I have to do the release, and we have jobs that gives us that signal whether our master K Kubernetes, Kubernetes branch is healthy, um, whatever changes that are sitting inside that branch, uh, are they okay to ship in a sudden release? So before we do that, um, I want to introduce you with a prerequisite topic, something called Kubernetes version markers. So 
So every single day, we are receiving these hundreds of PRs from so many contributors around the world. And every time we receive a new change, we have few jobs, we few scripts, you can understand, that keeps checking out all the code from Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repository with all these changes and build artifacts out of them. And when I say artifacts, it means Kubernetes binaries. Because we want to test whatever changes, whatever new changes that are now added to our Kubernetes slash Kubernetes master branch, are they actually building binaries that are not breaking any other changes? So that's where Kubernetes version markers helps us. Kubernetes version markers are text files, uh, which acts as sort of public API for accessing Kubernetes builds. So what does this mean? For example, I, cre I created a PR to add some changes to Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repo. Now a job or a script ran, and it created a fast release of Kubernetes, which gave me Kubernetes binaries. And now I'll store those binaries somewhere so that whenever I want to run some test on a cluster that's built out of this new binaries, I can just get those binaries from some place where I've stored them. And in Kubernetes case, we store them in GCS buckets. So any artifact of any successful Kubernetes build, Kubernetes fast release, which we store in Google Cloud Storage bucket, we call them Kubernetes version markers. Here is an example. For example, this is a screenshot or a snapshot of um, a GCS bucket we use for Kubernetes project. Uh, KRTS release dev, and if you see, there is a uh, path I am marking here, KRTS release dev hyphen CI. Inside that, there is a file KRTS table one.txt. That's the file we are talking about as a Kubernetes version marker. What that file contain is this big version. This is an old example. We are looking at a version marker for uh, 126 release. So how to read this version marker and what do we exactly do with this version marker for what we are getting what we are seeing here is a file which just contains some version but how do i get the build uh, artifacts the actual kubernetes binaries which i can use so whatever version which i got from the skts table onetxt file there is a there will also be a folder inside this path kts release dev slash CI, and that's exactly that version we got from that stable onetxt file. And inside that, what I see here is all the artifacts that I built from a certain state of or a snapshot of Kubernetes slash Kubernetes master. Um, which one? We can understand that from the version marker itself. So the first part of the version marker, 126.3, that's the base release tag. Whenever there was a release for Kubernetes 126.3 patch release, that's the first part of that version marker. On the right-hand side, that big um, commit SHA-like number, that's actually the latest commit on our release branch. We are talking about 126 here, so the, the number, the, the big pattern on the right-hand side is the latest commit as of uh, when that's, uh, this screenshot was taken. And the middle number is the number of commits from the current uh, latest commit on release 126 branch from the time uh, 126.3 was cut. So there are 41 commits between this time duration. And that's what this version marker is telling. OK, uh, this version, this particular uh, directory in our GCS bucket contains build artifacts from this particular snapshot of Kubernetes slash Kubernetes uh, repo on release 126 branch. How do we do that? There is a job we run. So Jason introduced a bit about Prow. Uh, Prow is a CI CD tool built by Kubernetes, and it's built mostly for Kubernetes projects. It's now adopted by other projects as well, which is great. Um, so we, it's, it, you can understand it as any other CI tool, for example, GitHub Actions or GitLab. We have a tool, uh, we have a talk from KubeCon EU 2023 that covers entirely about how to read these jobs. But I'll try to explain a bit here as well. The first highlighted part here, line number one, that says periodic. So here we are trying to define a job 
kind of telling it it's a periodic job, it needs to run at a certain period. Um, in line number second and fourth, um, I am giving the name, a name to this particular job. I'm calling it CI Kubernetes Build 126. And in line number four, I am saying, please run this job at every one hour interval. Line number three, I miss cluster KRS infra prow build. Jason also introduced prow uh, follows a model of Kubernetes itself, which is control plane and worker plane, or uh, in case of prow service clusters and build cluster. So here we are telling, and, and from Kubernetes, we know we could have multiple worker nodes. Similarly, we could have multiple build clusters in Prow. We are mentioning basically which build cluster to use for this particular job. We are uh, giving it the name for that. Line number five um, helps us to do that entire thing. So it, it is, what we are doing here is we are giving some um, annotation here, decorate set to true. What this annotation does is it tells Prow, now you need to, um, check out something. You need, we are calling it, we need to build Kubernetes from the Kubernetes slash Kubernetes uh, master or a certain release branch. We need to uh, build binaries. How to do that? All that functionality is initiated by line number five, but what needs to really check out, we are giving that in line number six to nine. We are telling it, please look for the GitHub or Kubernetes, repo Kubernetes, and release branch, release 1.25. 26. Please check out the uh, code from this particular Kubernetes repo and then do something about it. These are some another uh, other set of annotations for whenever uh, we also plug in whatever we are going to see. For example, whenever this job is going to run, uh, we need to post the log somewhere. We need to see whether the job ran successfully or not. And we show some of those statistics on a tool called test grid, and we are calling it which uh, test grid dashboard and test grid tab name. Uh, we need to, that's relevant for that, this particular talk, so I'll pass. Um, labels. We are also passing more information because this job needs to run inside a Kubernetes cluster. Um, it needs certain credentials. And when I set stuff like preset, dined, enabled, or reset service account, these labels do add, provide some more data to our uh, prow uh, node. I'll show that in the example right after this. Finally, we have the spec. It is like any Kubernetes port spec. Here we are giving uh, an image uh, on line number 21. This is the image you have to use to create a port inside, container inside a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we are giving it Kubernetes CI Builder. That's, that's the uh, image that is what we use to build uh, Kubernetes binaries. And everything else is similar to any other Kubernetes port spec. We are setting up resources here. Line number 3031, we are giving it privileged access. And finally, we are doing something inside that container. Uh, what we are doing here is running a CREL command. CREL or KREL, it's a tool. Uh, created again by Kubernetes project itself for uh, our release process. It stands for Kubernetes release. Um, what we are doing, that is exactly the tool that we use to do any releases. So even our minor releases, patch releases, um, any other RC, beta, alpha cut, all those are cut by uh, using this tool called Kerel. We also do fast releases, and that's what we are doing here. Um, I'm just telling it Kerel. Um, CI build, build the Kubernetes from what we um, kind of like the code we checked out from Kubernetes slash Kubernetes release 126 branch, build the Kubernetes binaries out of that and dump them in a bucket, which is we are telling it on line number 38, uh, dump all those binaries in Kubernetes hyphen release dev in a registry. Um, all the images that you are creating, apart from the binaries, put, put them in that registry and add a version marker. So whatever whatever is whatever version is created out of that particular build, fast build, put that version in a file called kts hyphen stable one. How all this process when that job actually runs and inside a Kubernetes cluster, how does that look like? Let's see. So whenever uh, Prow gets a trigger for that. A pod is created. 
we saw the port is created using a container image called KTS CI Builder. We also gave it some information from where it has to check out the code. So it is checking out the Kubernetes slash Kubernetes, which is it's cloning the Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repo at release 1.26 branch. I also talked about certain uh, labels, like which were uh, prefixed by preset. So what those label do? Uh, preset service account when set to true, it gives us this information. What it's doing is it's setting up two environment variable, uh, Google application credentials, E2E Google application credentials, some information that's giving on wherever the cluster is going to be, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's, it's giving us some information to interact to the Google uh, GCS bucket where we are going to store our build artifacts. Um, the actual uh, JSON file, service account.json file is also added to our board as a volume. We also had another preset, dined enabled, that Again, sets another environment variable, Docker and Docker enabled, set to true. Again, uh, creates an empty uh, directory Docker graph to make sure we can um, run Docker inside this Docker image container. And finally, once our pod environment is set up, what we do is we run this crel command, which again, we discussed, it's, it's going to do a fast release, it's going to do um, to create, it's going to create Kubernetes binaries out of this particular clone and dump them into a bucket KTS release dev and provide the version marker in KTS-stable1.txt. I also talked about those uh, annotations we had where we were setting test grid name or something that was, but this is how uh, that UI looks. So if I usually in Kubernetes cluster where all these jobs run, not everyone in the community actually hardly anyone in the community have access, have admin access to those clusters to actually go and exec inside the board and look at the logs. So uh, that's not ideal. We need to consume the logs to check if something failed at some point, how to fix that. So we use this CI, uh, this user interfaces where we dump all this um, logs that are coming out from this boards. Uh, so this is one of the user interface we have called browse pie class. Here I can see whatever happened from the beginning of that board creation. We ran that rel command. Uh, it also, we, we had those dyn enable uh, preset label set up, so it, Docker and Docker is also enabled. Finally, we, we had also provided its service account label so it can see the service account, and once everything is set up, it's running the rel command. That's where uh, we can find that job. This is a screenshot from test grade. So we now know what are Kubernetes version markers, how to use them, how to uh, use the artifacts that we built and stored in GCS buckets to do something useful with them. That's where our second examples come in. We deep dive into end-to-end -end tests. That's, so here is another example from the Kubernetes project itself. It's a release blocking job, uh, which means this is going to be one of the jobs that's going to give a CI signal whether to go ahead with any release or not. Um, any as in which releases also we will see from this particular example. Again, going from the first line, it's a periodic job. We are telling it it's going, it should run at every three hours interval from line number four. Second, third is same. We are setting the name of the job, giving it which build cluster it needs to be scheduled on, setting up few labels for adding all those credentials and volumes. Dashboard, uh, test script dashboard, test script tab name, description tells us where, uh, again, we can't exec inside our pod uh, in these uh, Kubernetes clusters, so we need to show these logs at some place. We use test script for that, and we are providing where exactly. So this particular job uh, data will come on test grid dashboard conformance volume conformance GCE, which particular tab would be conformance GCE master, and uh, we are giving a one-line description here. Um, we have two another annotations here, fork per release, fork per release replacements. So Kubernetes does not maintain just one minor or, uh, yeah, minor release. We maintain multiple minor releases and multiple patch releases for multiple minor releases. So uh, this, but at line number 13 and 14, we are giving that information that if for every release, do a fork. 
and re replace those placeholders. Again, we have the spec section for what's going to be inside this, the container of this uh, job. We are going to build this container this time with a new image called Kubekins E2E. It's going to be relevant because this image ships with something that Jason introduced in the first part of this talk, um, which actually is kubetest. I just saw I've written it there. So this image comes with kubetest2. That's the tool that we use to build um, binaries or bring up a cluster, then run test and bring down the cluster while collecting all the logs. So this is the image. Uh, that ships with those tools, along with other tools like gcloud and kubectl. gcloud to talk to our GCS uh, uh, or GCP buckets. We, we can also have these jobs running on AWS, so those, those other tools also ship as well. kubectl to interact with the new cluster whenever it comes up. Um, and now these are the arguments. So here we are saying, we are now going into the details of what kind of test is running here. Here we are saying, um, on line number 21, use the test scenario Kubernetes end-to-end -end test. So there is a link at the bottom of this page, git.ks.io slash testinfra. That's the repo where all our test details that run inside this pro jobs are, if not all, at least some of some major uh, bulk of those details that actually points to other places uh, where our tests are stored in Kubernetes project. So we have those scenarios stored at that path, and out of all those scenarios, we are telling it just use the Kubernetes end-to-end -end test. And then in whenever you use the scenario, use these other different set of arguments as well to tell what, uh, what you actually, where you actually need to run those end-to-end -end test scenario. So let's see again this in action. Here we have a port. We created the container using kube test uh, Kubekin's end-to-end -end image, we set the uh, preset service account true uh, that helped us to check out Kubernetes slash test infra at master, uh, as well as added all those um, environment variables, uh, service account volume. Similarly, we gave it get as SSH, so we, in this particular test, uh, we need uh, SSH keys we are adding with this another uh, preset. And that's, this is where our command is coming in the place. So we asked it to run this particular test scenario called uh, test infra slash jingin slash scenario Kubernetes end-to-end -end test. What this particular Python file does is it actually creates a kube test command. It, all, all this file does is whatever all the arguments that we provided it in front of it, use them and creates a kube test to command for us. So here uh, we are telling it, use kubetest2 and use all this information that I'm giving, for example, the GCP service account to interact with the GCP cluster, use the provider GCE. So here we are saying you need to use a deployer, uh, GCE deployer, that means you have to bring up a cluster in Google Cloud Platform. Um, we are giving it other settings like GCP network, do, do use this configuration uh, for master images, use those images or zones, etc. All those information we are providing. And the service account we provided, uh, we use, that actually is used to authenticate with gcloud. We saw that there is not a, a project, GCP project flag anywhere here uh, when we saw. So we need to actually tell it which project, which GCP project you have to interact to. That comes, that information comes from that boss course piece uh, which Jason introduced early on. That's a lease management tool, so whenever we are running these jobs inside Prow, there is a lease management tool in the picture that dynamically provides access to um, these cloud resources. So in this case, if GCP project is missing, kubetest2 will try to get a GCP project from boss course. Once the, all that is done, this is where our Kubernetes version markers are coming in the picture. We are telling, please don't build everything from scratch. Don't go and uh, build whatever uh, new artifacts you have to build. Rather, use what's coming from this uh, version marker. So we are telling it, use this CI bucket, KTS release dev, which we saw, and use this version marker CI slash latest fast. So a note, we just don't have that stable one.txt file alone. We have more like those, which contains different version markers. Um, 
and uh, in turn different uh, binaries attached to them. So here we are giving it another one, latest fast. Go and look in KTS release dev GCS bucket, uh, latest fast uh, tag, and then download it from there. And then basically use those binaries to now bring up a cluster, run some tests, which we're here we are calling it use the Ginkgo uh, tester, run conformance tests, and then bring it down. So what's really happening here is, this is like a snapshot of Kubernetes cluster, for example. Here we have a cluster, KTS Infra end-to-end -end Boscos. Uh, we, the name of the cluster we provided in our Brow job context, so our kubectl config set text context is now set to that cluster. We ran Ginkgo end-to-end -end test because we asked it to use Ginkgo provider, and we are running using Ginkgo to run some conformance tests here. Whatever logs, whatever test results are uh, generated out of that particular test run, we are taking them out, dumping them on a certain uh, path in our container, and then bringing down the cluster. Because all we needed was to run some tests uh, and check whether those tests are good or not to make sure these changes are uh, working fine with our existing state of Kubernetes cluster. So that's what's happening, and in the end, these, those if if I as a known uh, admin, what is this? Uh, if I as a known admin have to uh, check those logs, I will look for them in a place like this test. The link is down there. It's pointing to testgrid.ktest.io slash conformance gc conformance gc master, and that is the information we provided in annotation somewhere. So that's the end of our example two demo. Kubernetes project. Uh, now recommends using kubetest2, but it also had a successor before called kubetest. Um, that is also in use in some part of the Kubernetes project, but we are moving towards kubetest2 right now. So that's just a note there. Uh, if you want to start using kubetest2 for any of you, uh, kubetest or kubetest2, kubetest2 would be the recommendation. But we can't do all this testing uh, with kube test or all this prow job testing locally, uh, like we do not want to just run the test in, on Kubernetes co slash Kubernetes right away. Uh, before we do that, we want to test those changes maybe locally as well or somewhere at least. So there are some ways to test these prow jobs. Uh, one of the easiest ways pull that Docker uh, image that we we provide in our port spec of prow job pull that down on your local machine, and then run all the commands that we provide in the command section. Or there is a tool called Feno. That could do the same for you. You can ask Feno, uh, giving it a URL uh, of the job from test grid. Like, use that job, but now run it locally. And it will do it for you. It will uh, look at the port spec. Um, it will fetch that image down for you and run keep prompting you to provide um, information like GCP project or GCP, GCP service account. So it will, it will do the manual uh, handling. But that's not always possible, because not, if, not every one of us has access to these um, cloud service account. So the best thing, at least, um, not the best, but what we usually do in Kubernetes project is we actually just PR these submit uh, prow jobs on uh, this repo called Kubernetes slash test infra, which is the home for all our other prow jobs for Kubernetes project. You PR it there, and it can then run inside the PR, and you can check whether this job is running or not. And based on that, merge it or make changes. The conclusion here is um, kubetest2 is a tool that can allow to quantify your entire Kubernetes cluster life cycle from building up the cluster from uh, actually building the binaries, then using those binaries with all these changes that are coming from different places. Um, uh, yeah, to bring up a cluster, run some tests on them, uh, bring the cluster down, because we do not want to keep our course running upwards. Um, use those logs that are generated from the test durations to take a call. That could be anything. We use those, um, those test statistics to make a many, many sort of decisions. For example, 
to, uh, to create a CI signal whether we should go ahead with a release or not, or maybe whether to merge a PR or not. That was our first example. And with that, we are at the end of our talk. Um, if you want to try kubetest2, that's in sigs.kts.io slash kubetest2. We have a few in-tree cloud providers there. Um, kind, which would be the easiest one if you want to just get started. Uh, GCE, GKE also comes with that. And there are a few out uh, of tree providers for Azure and I believe um, AWS. So if you want to try using those, that's also an option. And if you want to build a kube test to deploy of your own, uh, there was another talk in the middle of the slides. If you want to talk to people who have built kube test to, the place would be SIG uh, testing, SIG KDS infra on Kubernetes Slack, that is slack.kdes.io. Um, we speakers are available at P. Sagu and Jason Braganza as well uh, as on the same Slack, slack.kdes.io, and that's our, those are our emails. Um, any questions? I need, we're at time, actually over time, and we're on break. No time for questions now. Uh, coffee break, and we'll be back in 20 minutes. Thank you.